Next up, we have uh, Tish Dar. His talk is uh, Making PCB Prototypes in uh, Kenya. Uh, Tisham is a uh, non-practicing electronics engineer working as a software engineer and almost PhD. Uh, he formerly worked in remote sensing as a GIS developer, but has been an embedded systems enthusiast for a long time. He's currently building the logistics platform of the future in Africa. Please welcome Tish. Thank you. So uh, last talk I was talking about doing energy monitoring and PCB design. This talk is a much softer talk about like the life around PCB design, getting stuff in place, getting people interested in doing it, doing it in Kenya. Uh, a lot of the a lot of uh, African continent is more a consumer continent. Stuff is not built. Uh, yeah, stuff is extracted. Everything else that's high value is imported. You just export uh, from Kenya. The major exports for goods is uh, tea and coffee, and we import tourists who give money. But if you want to see a gazelle, you come to Kenya. But not if you want to see electronics and PCBs. So, uh, so yeah. So I. I Grew up in Kenya, uh, so this was my high school. So I, one of my colleagues was jokingly saying I peaked in high school. So I did a lot of fun stuff in high school. So we had uh, electrical tech as a subject. So in my high school, you could either do power, uh, power mechanics, which meant you worked on cars. You could do electrical tech, which meant you worked on wiring houses, doing conduits, or yeah, doing 741s and 955s, uh, any 555s, uh, or you did aviation. So it was one of the few schools where we had a plane. So yeah, so it was interesting going to school there. Uh, we had a lot of fun. We had like science fair where I built fully analog security systems with something with no cameras. But uh, I don't know if you have heard of TESS, the Transiting Exoplanet Observatory. So similar principle, like a fly's eye lens based with LDRs inside security system where it would have like big ball coverage and would see people moving or something. And that's sort of uh, a very analog uh, security system. We built uh, uh, like a metal detector with no local oscillator, but using an FM station as the frequency reference to generate beats uh, on, the, on, the, on, the magnetic, uh, on the magnetic field change on the coil. So yeah, we did lots of interesting stuff. So we had uh, an electronics market back then. It was just like a street market. So you'd go there and you'd like uh, shout, I want this. And then uh, they, would, they would get you a 741 or whatever, or a few resistors and put stuff on Vero boards. I didn't make PCBs, I just had Vero boards. I uh, don't have any pictures from back then, but you know, uh, it have been interesting. Uh, uh, yeah, so that was sort of going to high school. And then, uh, yeah, I finished. I went off to do university in Australia. Uh, and then the, I still kept in touch with my friends. We had done lots of projects, so I had a lot of big friend network. And I did electronics, I did stuff, I did imaging, proper imaging rather than this uh, you can't really see everything is blurry and the brightness is changing, so there is someone possibly there, <laughs> sort of stuff. But uh, yeah, then uh, I started coming back. So after settling myself in, I, uh, one of my high school friends on this picture, uh, Gishini, he started a company which, which is sort of a tongue-in-cheek Uber for trucks. So a platform marketplace where you can book trucks, it does logistics, you make sure stuff gets loaded, stuff gets, crosses borders, so on. So uh, he, he came to the US to study. He did a startup here, which, uh, which did uh, tablets for restaurants. So apparently they use them in uh, the Apple Bees everywhere. So that's, that's what was his startup. Then after he exited, he came back to Kenya he did this startup, and then, yeah. So he asked me over to come and be a technical lead. So, you know, I went back and I started doing stuff. Uh, a lot of it is software, uh, like uh, bringing data in for ships and trains and stuff that's bringing goods into the country. Uh, location data is part of the stuff, so uh, only maybe 40% of drivers have smartphones. 
uh, so the, a lot of their vehicles may have up to like five GPS trackers on them because the GPS tracking is a very fragmented business and none of them have proper APIs for federation. So like a bank may have a financial interest in that truck because it was bought on loan, they'll install a tracker, but the tracking service they've got doesn't have federation, so the truck owner doesn't have visibility on it, so the truck owner will install a tracker. And then the truck would be carrying some goods, and the goods are of interest to a third party, so they will track the goods with another tracker. And then maybe along come we, and we want to like give them jobs and book and do a platform, so we will install another tracker. So there was uh, this fun stuff of getting these trackers in. And these trackers are hard to get in, in Kenya as well. They come through back channels in Somalia. <laughs> Uh, yeah, so like uh, I would go down the street again, the same, and like uh, you know, give some cash and get a GPS tracker. <laughs> uh, and then I was installing them in uh, in trucks uh, with the cigarette lighter as a PowerPoint, so you could like sort of plug and play the tracker. You didn't have to go into the thing. So I bought a bunch of uh, cigarette lighters off, uh, and then hacked them to power the trackers. Yeah, so the, I was like, okay. Uh, I was looking at the bag we got, and there is a little cigarette lighter thing in there as well. The circuit is very similar. Uh, it's probably exactly the same. This one has two USBs, yeah, and it's just like a buck converter. They run pretty hot, they're pretty inefficient, they use stuff, so there's plenty of room. You could probably do a GPS in there as well, but then it don't have good sky view to give you good signal. Uh, so yeah, so that's sort of doing electronics there. That's the level of electronics you get there. So if you went to buy one of these in the US, you'll get something with SMDs, very compact. If you go to buy one of these in, in Kenya, you get that. Uh, so yeah, so I went back to my school. Uh, as I said, I sort of peaked in school. Uh, uh, I was the best student in Kenya in year 12, so I'm sort of a legend at my school. I give, and give talks, and I see all these young faces, and they want to do stuff. And I'm like, okay, so what can we do? And uh, they still have electrical tech at this school, so they learn all this stuff, and, but they can't make real stuff like I was talking about previously. You know, just mushing together stuff, uh, doing your custom designs. You can do designs as much as you want, but you can't source parts and get it built, so on. So let's find out, experiment and find out what, what we can do. Let's try to do a project, see what the roadblocks are, uh, something achievable, not something super complex. So there is this culture in Kenya called Juakali. Juakali literally means hot sun. Jua is sun, Kali is hot. So the people just sit out and make, uh, low, it's mechanical, so they make a lot of uh, low, low accuracy farm equipment using just scrap metal. Uh, you know, then on Netflix there is a movie, Boy Who Tamed the Sun, about this guy in Malawi who built a windmill from scrap. So sort of that sort of idea, repurposing stuff to build things. Uh, yeah, so the farm machinery people casually weld stuff together, and then this, the, the electrical distribution panel there is one of the distribution panels in one of these Juakali workshops. Uh, and then the next is like, outside that is like a place where they cook food, and so I'll talk about that uh, in a minute. So we did PCB assembly in a place like this. Uh, but uh, so that was, yeah, so anyway. So I was like, okay, so what can we do? And then there are small people who are doing stuff already, like using the mechanical stuff. So there is a company called AB3D who make uh, 3D printer uh, frames using that sort of low tolerance manufacturing and then you, they ju you just put in adjustments in the software to flatten the beds and so on. And uh, they repurpose printer, yeah, scrap printer motors, and the, the stuff that comes out comes from inside is the RepRap controllers, which cannot be made locally. So uh, from my energy monitoring stuff, I had this, uh, this energy, particular energy monitor. So Tesla makes power walls, and the power walls have like an energy meter and a controller which makes decisions based on how much is being generated, how much should go to the battery, how much should be exported back, and all this sort of logic. Uh, a company, a Canadian company makes these, uh, they call Neurio, and uh, they have these serious logic energy monitoring chips. 
And uh, previously, I have done all the stuff with Vangotech and ATM, Atmel, microchips, ch things. I hadn't touched the serious logic. So uh, my idea was, OK, I want to learn how this energy monitor I see works. Can we make a small breakout board, make something simple? Can I make it in Kenya? So I designed a very basic schematic from the data sheets, as you do. Uh, essentially, a breakout board that you can run at low voltages and measure the uh, put in low voltage AC waveforms into it and see how it performs, write drivers for it, and so on. So that's the very badly routed, very quick PCB. Uh, yeah, so then that's the KiCad render stuff. Uh, uh, and this morning I was having fun. I was trying to help Greg out by figuring out how Blender does it. So I was, uh, so I just did this this morning. So like, uh, it also carries connotations about getting stuff in Kenya. So suppose someone designs something and they want to do a crowdfunding campaign. So having these skills of making it as look as real as possible, stuff you can do with software uh, without importing stuff and going through the hard bits uh, may get you over the level where you can afford to buy stuff to make it real, say. Or get exposure that someone gives you a sponsor and makes it somewhere else. So yeah, so these are sort of skills I would like uh, to uh, share around. So yeah, so I went and ordered the board from PCBUA. This is who I used to use in Australia. And uh, that's sort of the pricing that you get. Uh, the Most of it is shipping, DHL shipping. Uh, and then the, this is the, where it gets painful. <laughs> it's not uh, US dollars, that's uh, Kenyan shillings, but uh, it's one to 100. So you order something for $60, $70, and you pay $37 tax on it. Previously, it used to be that they had this uh, customs regimen where they would op fee charge a fee to open the package to determine what the customs was, and the fee for inspecting was $50. <laughs> So, yeah, so it's uh, the customs is a huge barrier in getting stuff into the country. Uh, the stuff was designed for something I was working with, like for inspecting containers. But they didn't have a regimen for inspecting parcels and stuff, so they would just charge the $50 because that's what the system says should be charged for anything incoming. Uh, this is the bomb, uh, that's a uh, monster pricing. So, I think the price of merchandise total is uh, so, uh, is like 82, and then 60 dollars shipping on top, uh, and bringing the 140 down to 142. So, again, because uh, there are no local stockists there, even on the continent for parts, you have to get stuff in from Europe or U.S. or China. Either you pay DHL premium, or you wait for 45 days, or it never arrives even. Or you use Snickernet, you ask someone to put stuff. So I have, a, I guess, props, I have a bunch of stuff in there that I've uh, got Chris to come to his desk and I'm gonna take back in my suitcase, hopefully without problems. <laughs> <laughs> Last time I went to Kenya, I had my bag like full of PCBs that I had you know, prototyped or I was in various stages of failure. And uh, the customs opened my bag and they wanted me to tell them what the value of these things was so that they could charge me. I'm like, they are failed stuff, why do you want to charge? And he was like, you made this? They couldn't believe that I could make these things. <laughs> yeah, so that was, uh, that was interesting. Yeah, and then the same DHL note, $40 of uh, customs to get the stuff in. So it was very expensive PCBs uh, in the end. So yeah, it's great to get parcels. So the two parcels arrived, parts and PCBs. Uh, I got a few school friends together, and we were trying to assemble stuff. Uh, so uh, uh, Zach actually works for, so the guy is sitting there trying to get the soldering iron on. Uh, he works for Ericsson, so he's also an electronics engineer, but he's a sales engineer for Ericsson. So the not, stuff doesn't get made. A lot of stuff gets sold by Ericsson, by Huawei, by all of the manufacturers there. The telco network is huge, but not much gets made. Uh, the electronics engineers uh, ha use their knowledge, telecoms, whatever, to maintain, the, uh, service the systems, but not much original production happens. Uh, so yeah, then, uh, yeah, we sat around, we 
uh, talked about the PCB, we looked at the, you know, the 3D stuff, and then we got stuff made. This was uh, going back to the way the chapatis were being made on the hot plate, so we went downstairs to our restaurant, we bought a second-hand little pan, we put our PCBs on this uh, sort of uh, wooden stove to reflow them, and then, yeah, so we had this, we made this. <laughs> Yeah, so the so we made it. Uh, I, I think I have three boards here that we made. Uh, we made four. Uh, one of them, uh, so I so basically it works. A test rig using ESP32 and MicroPython code. It's just a serial bus on these things. Uh, it's very simple. So you just like uh, send a command and a checksum. It tells you what the value of the temperature is or the current voltage power is. Uh, it has like the temperature helps with the calibration because uh, there might be thermal drift in it when it's doing measurements. Uh, yeah, so it does work. Uh, cool. And then, uh, yeah, so we did the hardware. Now software is relatively easy, I guess. So most of this I, I wrote over a, a weekend. Uh, I do most of my drivers in MicroPython uh, these days. So the, just a bunch of registers, and you can run, uh, fun fact, you can run like MicroPython in Jupyter Notebooks. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, so it really makes iterative driver development easy. Yeah. I'm sorry, are you running it on the chips, like speaking to the chips? Yes. Okay. Yes. Cool, yes, yeah. So it makes uh, development really fast, iterative. You can get it wrong, and then eventually get it right, it's, uh, and then save it and share it and say, you know, rather than having to download uh, something to view Python, you have an interactive thing, you can drop in the picture of your chip, the wiring, you know, notebook stuff. Uh, yeah, so then I took one of the four boards to, I took the boards to a uh, Linux conference in uh, New Zealand, and then I gave it away to a person in New Zealand, and then he wrote stuff to run it on uh, just using the normal serial, Pi serial on standard Linux. So, yeah, so you can run it on MicroPython, on an embedded system, or anything that has a serial port. It's a very simple chip, just a, it's a very slow serial port by default, but it can do up to like 576, depending on whatever it put in multipliers that you put in the clock. Uh, so, yeah, so that sort of, it worked, it was expensive, there were barriers. So the, there is stuff that's going on in Kenya. There are, like, we went to the pumping station one. There's a similar makerspace uh, in Kenya uh, called Gearbox. Uh, they are setting up a few others. Uh, they, they, the founder there, Dr. Kamau, has given like TED Talks and stuff. They have designed their own uh, plasma cutter uh, that, that are made in Kenya. It's sort of the same Joakali principle, large scale, low tolerance but you can do plasma cutting, grills and stuff, it's big. Uh, they have a few prototyping facility things. They have, I think that's a, I think that's a sort of a milling machine that's cutting stuff on there. Uh, and then they, they can help you assemble prototypes there. But there's only one, one place and the membership fee is like $40, which is the same as the pumping station one fee, but uh, $40 is a lot in Kenya where like a graduate engineer's starting salary is something from 700 to $1,000 per month. So yeah, so the, uh, anyway, so the, the, it's, it's starting, but maybe the, a lot of stuff needs to be done. You can make your PCB, but then sourcing a uh, esoteric part like a energy monitor IC is again still difficult because no one stocks them locally. You'll still have to get it in from somewhere else. This is what uh, component sourcing looks like, I guess. Uh, there is a lot of uh, mobile phones. Uh, so there are, there are stocks for mobile phone replacement parts, resistors, very small ones, and they're stored in shelves like this. Uh, and then these uh, sort of vendors are not online. They, you go and again, you ask for a particular part and they pull it out and it's old school. Uh, it works. Uh, it, these places are always busy because everyone has a phone and in their break and they go out to someone in the street to get it repaired. This person goes to the vendor with the stuff in the shelves and sources the part, uses hot air, fixes your phone. You don't have to spend another hundred dollars on a new phone. Uh, yeah, so that's, that's sort of the electronics market is there. There is sort of a community. There's a funny green sign you see there. That's a, that's a common feature in Kenya. I don't know if anyone has heard of M-Pesa. 
no, 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 no. M-Pesa is uh, mobile money. So essentially, a lot of people are unbanked. So the telco functions as a bank. So you can run USSD codes onto G3G networks, send commands to the telco, uh, send a PIN, and then transfer from mobile to mobile payments. Uh, so that's, uh, that's sort of the dominant method of payment in most places. So most places will show this number, and then you just send, send cash to the vendor. It's cashless, it's mobile phone based. And yeah, so the mobile is a big part of everything. Okay, so some good stuff, good news stories. Uh, there is a company called Brick, uh, which does, uh, their core product is obviously the eponymous Brick, which is a network brick. So it's a multi-protocol network gateway. So it has satellite modems, it has 3G, it has Wi-Fi, it has everything. Uh, this particular board is called the Pico Brick, and it's like for deploying our sensor nodes. It has got the 2G, it has got the fancy stuff on top here is a sub gigahertz. So it's a TI sub gigahertz chip uh, with an RF booster. So it has a 20 kilometer range uh, using the sub gigahertz. So it's pretty cool. Uh, so these guys, uh, uh, they're like, they have been doing this for four or five years now. The, they had uh, Zuckerberg in their office and they were doing uh, network on uh, on the matatus on public transport. So they install the box, and then you get uh, Facebook access and other stuff access, and then they harvest your data, as usual. <laughs> yeah. So the the it's pretty cool. Um, another guy uh, from uh, the shop called Ketechnics, which is on this street. So if you have been to, I haven't been to Shenzhen, but I imagine it's similar. It's the electronic street. And that's where all the parts vendors are. And uh, they are like these houses. And you go up, it's a warren of things. Similar to Glodok in Jakarta or Simlim Towers in Singapore. It's just this warren of uh, electronics shops uh, where you can get stuff. And uh, he has a shop there, uh, K-Techniques. Uh, and uh, this uh, PCB here, it's a better version. Uh, this was Proto. And this is like his final production version. Uh, is a speed governor. So uh, speed, uh, public vehicles in Kenya are required to have speed governors to cut power to the engine when they overspeed. So there are no speed cameras or red light cameras or so on. So this is the, uh, the by law, each public service vehicle is supposed to have the speed governor, which uh, essentially has a relay and stuff and GPS, and it cuts power to the engine or cuts fuel to the engine when you overspeed to automatically slow you down. Uh, yeah, yeah. So uh, previously they were open loop, like not open loop. They were uh, unnetworked. So the new stack spec needs them to be uh, to send these alerts whenever a vehicle overspeeds back to the government. The vehicle, the automatic speed governance was triggered. Uh, so yeah, so he has done the design using the two five uh, two five sixty uh, mega chip, three G, and then just uh, GPS and stuff for the speed. And that's his shop. You can see the M-Pesa stuff. He stocks like usual uh, breakout boards and stuff. And then he also does the ECAD stuff on the side. Yeah, so creating prototypes is also not only difficult in Kenya. These are some of my friends from Brazil. So they came over to take delivery of an electronics uh, uh, energy monitor that I had designed bespoke for them. And it was easier for them to fly 35 hours and come to Australia from Brazil than for me to ship the prototype to them because it just gets stuck in customs for two months. <laughs> yeah, so it's not a problem unique to Kenya. A lot of developing countries have problem developing due to these barriers. Uh, the, so I did make the move to Kenya. I donated all my stuff to our Adelaide Makerspace. So this is the stuff I had to make stuff. It's not too fancy. This is all you need anyway. If you're working at a base level, yeah, reflow oven, hot air, soldering irons, uh, some magnifier glasses, some uh, PCB holder, clampy things. Uh, yeah, so finishing off, future of makers and electronics in Kenya. So you can see there's this downward curve in export part of the GDP. So over time, the Kenyan export industry has been going down. And because uh, low value stuff is exported and high value stuff is imported, uh, no, like you, when you're building stuff, you're adding 
value to stuff and then you export it, it goes out at a much higher price compared to what got in. So that has been going down. So there is need for bringing this back up, otherwise you just dig yourself into a bigger hole. Yeah, so just I'll leave this as a sort of a standing slide. Uh, most electronic engineers like making things. Uh, sometimes wherever, you know, your lack of birth may put you in a place where you, it holds you back. Uh, with creativity and recycling, you can do a lot of stuff. There is need for logistics, is a huge issue, and there is need for in-country stuff. I guess that's the reason for customs barriers existing, that it's supposed to encourage local industry, but what is it encouraging if there is no local industry? <laughs> so it's preventing stuff from being seeded anyway. So maybe there is need for stockists and manufacturing, and then maybe the government can do stuff. So. Uh, companies like Break and K-Techniques are blazing a trail in getting the tech built locally for local purposes because I don't think any other country really needs speed governors uh, or, uh, I, yeah. So anyway, so that's, uh, yeah, that's becoming eventually a producer of advanced technology. Maybe we'll see speed governors made in Kenya at some point. So you mentioned the the brick and the K techniques. Uh, you know, obviously those were designed in Kenya. W were they manufactured in Kenya? Yes. So the the brick board here was uh, made in Kenya. Okay. So parts were brought in in backpacks from China and the U.S. And then the assembly for the prototypes was done in Kenya. Um, internet and open source software. Uh, is there an open source scene in Kenya? Uh, yes. Uh, for uh, for like stuff like Python and uh, general web development stuff, pretty big. There is, uh, they had the first uh, Python conference last year. Uh, there's a plenty of plenty of developers there. Software is easier because there's no barrier, so that stuff just jumps around. So there's no barrier to entry for making stuff real and contributing back. I think there are a few kernel developers as well. So it's, it's software scene is pretty big. Uh, the hardware scene is uh, like sort of stifled by these sort of things. Who is uh, wor working on building that um, su supply network in Kenya? And is there a, a un with, with the understanding that there's, you know, there's a political and a, a kind of social um, kind of inertia, yes. right? Uh, that 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 goes along with that. But but it sounds like uh, there's market for parts, at least for a, a large number of uh, of, of uh, specialized applications and. Surely they're not all coming in backpacks. So, so is, is there, <laughs> the I mean, prototypes definitely are built using backpack stuff. Uh -huh. uh, the the for the other stuff, I guess uh, people pay the price, and there is yeah. uh, maybe fifty percent of the cost of the what you buy there is the logistics cost. Right. So everything is upmarked a lot. Yeah. Thanks. Thank you, Tish. No worries.